We're here today on RailerCulture.com. We're with uh, Dr. Jim Budzinski. He is the managing principal with Macro Game Partners based in Indiana. Welcome today, uh, Jim. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. Jim, you spoke to a, a group today in Winnipeg about uh, the U.S. economy. And you kind of gave a review of what's happened and gave some alternatives to what may happen in the future. I guess, is the U.S. out of the woods yet economically? Uh, my sense is no. Uh, I think what's happened is, if you think about crises as a couple phases, there's the first acute phase, like, oh my goodness, we have a crisis. We're through that, but now the long, tough issue of how do you clean up this mess is actually just beginning, and in my view, there are a number of places that the, uh, the process could still kind of uh, go awry, particularly given some of the government policies in terms of printing of money and other things that are going on in, in the U.S. right now. Um, you know, so we're hearing a lot out of the U.S. about uh, people uh, wanting to extend tax cuts, uh, not wanting to pay higher taxes, but at the same time saying we want to cut the deficit. Those two things don't seem to go together very well. Right, and, and actually, if you if you look at the U.S. political system, uh, there there isn't a requirement, sadly, that that uh, parties' uh, proposals necessarily hang together. And in the Republican Party, for example, they talk about cutting spending and cutting taxes as kind of one of their major planks. Uh, but they usually get around to cutting uh, taxes much sooner than they get around to cutting spending, which, as you, uh, your question implies, puts you in a situation where you're cutting the uh, revenues before you uh, do offsetting cuts. Uh, the good news is I think the elections in November, um, there were enough uh, people that are very fervent uh, supporters of limiting the size of government in the U.S., moving into positions of power. And uh, what's interesting is they don't, they don't need a majority. What they need is uh, kind of a vocal position in there, and it will really force a lot of people to look uh, uh, more clearly at that. And we've seen the same thing in Europe. I mean, uh, they didn't want to cut spending in Europe either, but in the periphery of Europe, uh, in Ireland, in uh, Portugal and Spain, already at this point, there are uh, a lot of fiscal austerity programs being implemented. So uh, I think it's only a matter of time before the U.S. has to kind of join the rest of the world in being a little more frugal about how much money they're spending, and, uh, and that's going to be a very uh, tough political debate because, uh, frankly, for a long time, the U.S. has uh, kind of ignored uh, fiscal discipline, and there's been this mindset that budget deficits don't matter. Uh, It'll all sort of work out in the end. Matter and and uh, we're the leader of the, the world, so we can pretty much do what we want. And I think the events of the last couple of years have seriously called into doubt the U.S. Uh, certainly financial leadership of the world, with a lot of people uh, looking at uh, how we got ourselves in this mess and how we managed ourselves through it, and asking big questions about uh, uh, whether we actually have a system of managing these things, and, and uh, uh, in a credit to Canada, as an example, uh, if you look at some of the things that Harper uh, has done, your Prime Minister, and, uh, and, and the conservatism of the banks in terms of not doing foolish things, um, Canada's done a, been a far better role model than the U.S. Right. in terms of managing responsibly uh, their government, and their finances, and their banking system, uh, and we could learn a lot from them. Uh, Canada's in a really unique situ or an interesting situation because um, obviously there was a benefit to the finance, the banking regulation uh, that is here in comparison to the U.S. But at the same time, the U.S. is a very, very important customer of, of Canada in terms of exports, and we're obviously right beside each other. Um, the joke is, or always, you know, if, if uh, the U.S. gets the flu, Canada catches a cold. Yeah. The U.S. sneezes, Canada catches the Right, flu, exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and so when we look at, uh, you know, obviously we're having to, f to deal with the, the par dollar as a, you know, as really an exporting country. There are some challenges there. As Canadians, what should we think about the future of the U.S. economy? Well, I guess my sense is uh, it'd be great to think that uh, things are going to go back to the way they were in terms of uh, relative currencies, et cetera. But it'd probably be unrealistic. Uh, the reality is uh, we've done serious damage to the value of our currency. All of our actions right now, including QE2, which is underway as we speak, uh, 
seem designed clearly to lower the value of our currency still further relative to, to other countries. And, uh, and because Canada has uh, uh, up, had an open exchange rate um, and has a better financial system in terms of their uh, uh, balance sheet, um, I think we, while we may see some uh, short-term reversals, particularly in, uh, in times of crisis where the dollar tends to rise, if I take a five or ten year horizon out, uh, the strength of the Canadian currency uh, relative to the U.S. is likely to persist for a long time. So, so what Canadians, I think, need to be thinking of is rather than there's a short term aberration here that when it corrects itself will, will allow me to uh, uh, you know, kind of go back to doing what I, I was doing, rather they need to think in terms of what am I going to do if this doesn't change right. and how do we get competitive uh, does it change the areas we want to export? Does it change who we want to export to? Um, the U.S. probably may become a smaller part of uh, Canada's uh, export mix because of this currency uh, uh, situation. And uh, there are going to be long-term trade impacts of uh, what's going on with the U.S. currency uh, moving forward. And uh, uh, I would expect people are going to have to adjust to uh, what's what's been termed the new normal right. uh, in terms of uh, the way the U.S. economy is going to function and how uh, the U.S. is likely to relate to the rest of the world. And you alluded to your presentation as one of the, the outcomes. Is, should, is there really a chance that the U.S. could become the next Japan? Yeah, I think there's a, a very real chance. Uh, uh, as I alluded to in the presentation, it, to me it's probably uh, a, a hybrid between the Japan situation, which was 20 years of economic malaise really caused by a, uh, a meltdown of a bubble followed by an inability to write the assets, unwillingness or inability to write the assets down to their true value. Um, the U.S. is doing in, in, in different asset classes precisely the same thing, is that we had an epic bubble in housing um, and we're failing to write those assets down and uh, the government has been specifically targeting asset prices, uh, whether it's the stock market or keeping the price of your housing up. And uh, the reality is, until you let assets find their true value, uh, it's hard to get growth going because it's all artificial. And, uh, and we're heading down that road. Now, where we're different from Japan is the U.S., in contrast to Japan, really was the world's reserve currency. And most commodities, uh, oil, uh, corn, wheat, etc., are priced in dollars and sold globally. Uh, as a result, um, we may uh, pursue similar philosophies to what Japan did, but we may have a kind of a different outcome because uh, uh, those commodities uh, will jump in dollar terms as our cur currency weakens, and we may see a very uh, challenging environment, not unlike what we saw in the uh, in the 70s, uh, where we have a combination of low growth but high inflation. And one of the big, uh, in my view, uh, uh, disconnects is the assumption that if we have inflation, that means everything's going up. But if we have deflation, that means everything is going down. Uh, the reality is, uh, I think it's perfectly possible that you can have deflation in housing, uh, certain manufacturing sectors, uh, certain retail sectors tied to kind of the, our, our past in consumption. At the same time, you have inflation in commodities and food and and a lot of uh, things uh, at the same time. So uh, that kind of a hybrid mix is very difficult because the policymakers, particularly the Fed, want to look at it as, well, since the price of these certain assets, capital intensive assets, is going down, we don't have inflation, therefore we can print money with impunity because we don't have inflation. Well, ask somebody who's buying a gallon of gasoline or a, a, you know, a loaf of bread, if, uh, if we have inflation, I think they'll tell you a different story. So this could be a good period for, for farmers? Could be a very good period. Uh, uh, farmers everywhere, I think, had a tailwind, which was the, the huge growth in emerging markets. Uh, and as those economies move into middle class and put more protein in their diets, farmers, particularly grain farmers around the world, I think will have a, a very uh, strong tailwind uh, in terms of support. Where there may be challenges, and Canada may be a good example, is, is that you kind of have a push and a pull at the same time. Uh, global commodities are going to be in a bull market, but your currency is going up at the same time. So 
uh, while one of them is helping you, the other is hurting you, and it's not entirely clear how that battle is going to work out. Uh, in it's the, definitely in affected years. our hog and our beef business. Yeah, I would imagine it will continue to be a challenge, particularly for the what I'll call the downstream protein players. Um, and, and frankly, even rising commodity prices continue to, uh, people tend to look at ag as one industry, but really it's two. There's everybody that's above corn and the wheat in the chain and everybody that's below. And if you're above it, selling inputs, life's pretty good. If you're below it, buying those outputs and using it, uh, particularly if you're selling to a consumer that's very price sensitive or in the markets that are very price sensitive, you can get what's referred to as a classic uh, you know, uh, commodity uh, price squeeze and margin compression because uh, you're kind of squeezed on both ends. And, and we're seeing a lot of people in the food industry uh, downstream, uh, consumer packaged goods and other players with this, uh, with this challenge playing out. Jim, thanks a lot for joining us today and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again in the future. Thanks, appreciate your time.